Let me share my screen. I have to share several screens today with you all to go over this material. But I just wanted to pull up because technically you, you guys go over this homework for module as homework. But I wanted to point out some things. So on the physiology test, all of these bold face terms that you see, you need to make sure you know what they are. So this homework four basically covers what are called somatic senses. We have two basic types of sensory reception in our body. One is called the somatic senses, and that's where you feel pressure, pain, uh, touch, um, cold, hot, all of those types of things, what we call somatic senses. Next week, we cover the organs of the special senses. The special, special senses are vision, your eyes, hearing, the inner ear structure, equilibrium and balance and smell and taste. All of that is what we call special senses. So <clears throat> we have special receptors that detect changes in different type of stimulation. For instance, you stick your finger with a needle, a pain receptor is going to fire. It's going to tell your brain, ouch, I got something stuck in my finger. Receptors are our way of determining when anything changes in our environment. And so some of those receptors are referred to as exteroceptors. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this chapter. I just wanted to point out some of these receptors. Exteroceptors are receptors that are going uh, to be more towards the surface of the body, near the surface of the body. And so that like exterior, you could think of extero as exterior. And so <clears throat> all of the extero receptors uh, process external information from our environment, right? All of the special senses you see, you hear, you taste, you smell, you feel, all of that we're collecting information from our external environment. But we also have receptors on the inside of our body in many, many, many different places, in different tissues. You have them around certain blood vessels, in, in the walls of blood vessels, you know, uh, and tubes that are digestive system and the reproductive system. All the, the receptors in our body, on the inside of our body that detect changes in stimulation that we typically don't have conscious control over are referred to as interoceptors. And you can think of those uh, as interior. That's how I would remember that. So like in the walls of blood vessels, they can determine blood pressure. In visceral organs, like in your urinary bladder, how do you know you have to go to the bathroom, right? Um, so those types of things. And then proprioceptors. These are receptors that are still on the inside of our body, but they're isolated around where our skeletal muscles join to bones at joints. So guys, I'm sure you covered the joints already in your lecture. Um, the proprioceptors receptors tell our brain when our arms and legs are moving, basically when you're active. So our brain knows when we're, we're physically active or if we're just sitting still. That's because of proprioceptors. When, you're, when your bones are moving because your muscles are pulling on tendons and you know the joints are moving, proprioceptors in and around all of those tell our brain that we're moving and we need to have blood flow and oxygen support to our muscles because they're being active, right? Now they have names of different types of receptors that have the job of detecting different types of stimulation. So any type of receptor that responds to changes in pressure or movement or physical forces of uh, hearing. And we don't know how hearing works yet, but it's because of a movement of fluid across a little cell with cilia, but it causes the cilia to move. Those are called mechanoreceptors. Thermoreceptors are receptors that respond to differences in temperature, thermo, right? Nociceptors are our pain receptors. Free nerve endings detect pain. Photoreceptors are in the retina of our eye. Of course, we're covering that next week, but they detect changes in light so we can see, 
chemoreceptors respond to changes in chemicals. We taste our food because we are responding to certain molecules that are dissolved in our saliva on our taste buds. You smell very similar odorant molecules being detected by the receptors in our nasal cavity. So we have chemoreceptors that detect changes in bodily fluids. They're located in special blood vessels. So when your oxygen changes and your CO2 changes and your pH changes in your blood, chemoreceptors detect that. Then osmoreceptors are very special because they detect a change in water balance in our blood specifically something called osmoregulation because of an, uh, what's called osmotic pressure. We're going to cover this more so in AMP2, but the, the short of it is this. Osmoreceptors allow our brain to know if we're dehydrated and we have to drink water or if we're overhydrated because you can be overhydrated um, because when water balance changes in our blood, it changes something called osmotic pressure. I don't want to get into all of that right now. We have way too much to cover uh, to worry about exactly what that is. But you could just remember that osmoreceptors monitor water balance in the blood. That's an easy way to put it. All right. So as you go down through this homework four module, um, just make sure you read through the different paragraphs. Any bold faced terms, you should you should make notes of that and know, you know, what it is, right? Now, I did want to point out this before we move on to the brain. Under thermo sensations with the thermoreceptors, I'm not going to ask you exactly the, the temperature range that the receptors respond to. More so, you know, the thermoreceptors respond to when it's cold or warm. So we have some are called cold receptors and some are called warm receptors. So obviously, you could uh, relate to the fact that when something's cold. You don't have to, you know, memorize exactly what's going on with the temperature difference. If it's 50 degrees, it's cold. If it's 90 degrees, it's hot, right? So I'm not going to put these numbers on the test. So make sure you, re you review that, all right? Now, today specifically, we're covering exercise nine, which is the brain and the cranial nerves. <laughs> After I'm done talking over uh, the physiology stuff and pointing out some of the anatomy on some pictures, I'm going to pull up a, uh, at least the brain model so I can show you the cranial nerves. You're going to have to be able to identify the cranial nerves on the inferior view of the brain model. And some students get confused with that. But um, before I pull the PowerPoint up, which I want to teach you from, I want to show you here's a chapter in the engage manual. Again, review the material in the paragraphs. It's only a couple of pages as far as the physiology is concerned. And you see all these bold face terms? I'm going to be mentioning these, what all of these different terms are in the PowerPoint in a minute. So what I would do if I were you, and I would do it today, you have time to do it, pull this manual out unless you've already done it, and get a notebook and write, the, type, the name of the, the heading here, and then write down what the boldface terms are and define them. Same thing with what are ventricles? What is cerebrospinal fluid? I'm going to be talking about all of this. Where does cerebrospinal fluid come from? So, and, and the flow of it. Where does cerebrospinal fluid flow from and to? So we're going to, we're going to talk about that. I'll mention the blood-brain barrier um in my powerpoint as well these there are special cells called astrocytes that are referred to as neuroglial cells and it's one of six types of neuroglial cells those cells form what's called a blood brain barrier and basically it protects the brain and it prevents unwanted large molecules from leaving the blood and entering our brain tissue. However, we do have certain structures and glands that are in a centralized location that are not protected by the blood-brain barrier. And those are called circumventricular organs. 
and I'll point out those names as well, but you can see uh, the circumventricular organs include the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, and something called the pineal gland. Now, unless you've looked at the brain already, you're not going to know where these are or what they are. That's what we're about to do. But what's interesting here is that they believe that um, when someone has the HIV infection and it enters the brain, they believe that it enters through the blood supply to these specific places because it's not protected by that barrier. So these are called CVO, circumventricular organs, right? Now, as far as the parts of the brain are concerned, I'm going to basically what I did for today is I took my lecture PowerPoint and I just omitted some slides from it because really what I like to do with, with that is to just go through the pictures. It's, it's hard to tell you, okay, we have the medulla oblongata. If you can't see where it is and we're looking at it, it makes it a little harder to learn what it is and what it, what it does. But I will say this. Um, because there's going to be a little bit more information in the PowerPoint than technically more descriptive than technically we cover in the lab. So in order to know exactly what is important about each part of the brain, go to this paragraph under the brain stem. What is the brain stem? It's made up of the medulla oblongata, the pons, and what's called the midbrain. So this paragraph talks about that. And I'm gonna mention um, at least down here what they call the tectum, the corporate quadrigemina. I'm gonna talk about the superior and inferior colliculi and show you where they are. And for instance, on the physiology test, it might say a question, what specific part of the brain stem is involved in visual stimuli reflexes? And you would say superior Colliculi, right? So get your information from these paragraphs. We, the cerebellum, the second largest mass of the brain. What are some important aspects about that? Something called the diencephalon, which is the very middle part that we're going to cover. I just mentioned what hypothalamus, but there's some other parts to it, the thalamus, and then the pineal gland, which sits in what we call the epithalamus. Um, so just, yeah, just go down through here and under the cerebrum, which is the largest mass of the brain. Every single bold-faced term I want you to review. Once you start getting down to the lobes of the brain, the questions are gonna come pretty much straight from here. What is the prefrontal cortex? What is the frontal lobe? You know, what's important about it in this paragraph? What is the Broca's speech area? What lobe is it located in? Oh, it's located in the frontal lobe. What does it do? It's a motor center that allows us to make words, speech. What happens if we have damage to the Broca's area because of a stroke? Oh, we can't form clear words. You understand language, but you can't form the words correctly. I'm sure you, you heard a little bit about that when someone has a stroke. That's called expressive aphasia, right? So go through your paragraphs, make your notes, and learn them. Now, the next part just has, you know, the anatomy on the brain and the various structures you're gonna be identifying. So as you're going through learning this anatomy, you need to make sure that you're going over the Quizlets. I think I, last night I added another link. It's the same link, but I added another link to that uh, the models book, my models book that Dr. Blaylock put in the Quizlet. So make sure you pull that up. All right. And then the last thing that we have to do is go over the 12 cranial nerves. There's 12 pair of nerves that come off of the brain. Those are called the cranial nerves. You're going to have to know them by name and number. Right. And I'm going to show you those on a brain model specifically. I think the last thing we have to do actually is I'm going to, I'm going to have to pull up a sheet brain dissection. I don't know how good that we have the sheet brain dissection um, in the homework assignments. So I'm going to pull one up or I'm going to Google it and pull some up to show you what the sheet brain looks like and how to identify some of the parts on it. 
I think there's a few questions on the real brain, the sheep brain. All right, so does anybody have any questions about how you're gonna be reviewing the material in your Engage manual? All right, can everybody see the PowerPoint? Yep. yep. All right, very good. I didn't know if I have to keep stop sharing and then reshare or not. So that's good that I don't. All right, so basically this is the PowerPoint that I modified from lecture. This is obviously our lecture book. And I do that because they have some pretty good pictures in it, right? And it, it's easier to teach anatomy while you are able to see pictures. So let's just start and go through the areas. And I tried to include at least pictures and slides that covers in order some of the material out of the engaged lab manual. So let me show you some things that are important uh, off of the brain in general. This is general brain anatomy. You see the whole brain right here. They have a sagittal section through the brain and we're looking at the left side of the brain. This is the medial aspect of the left side of the brain because we cut it in half this way. Here's the right side. We're looking at the other side. So this is what we call that sagittal medial view. The largest part of the brain is the cerebrum right here. There's several different lobes to it that I'll point out in a little while. Um, and the outer part of, of the cerebrum is your conscious brain. You're able to see, hear, feel, taste, smell, all of that in this part of our brain. The second largest mass on the brain lies posterior and inferior to the cerebrum. And this is called the cerebellum. We're gonna cover that. We also have the brain stem right here. The brain stem is made up of three parts, something called the midbrain, which is this area right here. It's called the midbrain. Below that or inferior to that, at least in humans, because ours start to go inferior in your dog, it goes posterior, but in your cat, but inferior to the, the midbrain, we have the pons. This large part right here is called the pons, the next bump we see. Inferior to that, there's a small little bump elevation in this region that's called the medulla oblongata. Inferior to the medulla oblongata begins the spinal cord that goes down your vertebral column, right? Now, in this region, we also have the diencephalon that I just mentioned. The diencephalon is made up of three little areas, in fact. It's made up of a term I just used, the hypothalamus. Well, let's just start in the middle, the thalamus, right here. That's called the thalamus. And the part that lies below the thalamus is called hypothalamus. Hypo means below, right? So we have the thalamus in the middle. The hypothalamus is below it. And then we have something called the epithalamus which is technically where a special little gland is located. That little, that little, little elevation right there is called the pineal gland. Now we're gonna cover that more so, the, you know, all the glands and what they do in AMP2. For now, we have to identify a couple of them. The pineal gland over here, right? And there's some other things we have to identify right here. Can't see them too well on this picture, but I'll point them out as we go through. So we have the pineal gland here, but hanging off of the hypothalamus right there is the pituitary gland, right? So obviously this is a picture. This is a real human brain. You see the cerebrum. I didn't even point out this little tissue in the middle. That's called the corpus callosum. It's not identified on here, but that's called the corpus callosum. And are you no showing a photo or are, like, are you showing a model right now? Um, can you see the PowerPoint? Oh, just the PowerPoint. Yeah, I thought you were showing a model. Everybody. Oh, no, this is not the model. This is just one of the pictures out of our lecture book. Okay. Now, yeah, I'm going to pull the model up after I'm done. All right. Cool. Yeah, yeah, no, no worries. So, interestingly enough, we're about to get into uh, cerebrospinal fluid. Where does it come from? Where does it flow? As it turns out, there's cavities in our brain. There's holes in our brain. And those holes are filled with fluid called cerebrospinal fluid. Here's one of those holes. If, we, if you could look in there, there's a cavity in there. In each cerebral hemisphere, there's a large cavity, 
which is called the lateral ventricles. They're called the ventricles. Now, there's normally a little tissue over covering that ventricle. We're going to be able to identify that on uh, the model, and it, hopefully it'll be on the sheep brain when I, when I Google that a little later. But that's called a septum pellucidum. It would, a little tissue covers up that hole. Here's the thalamus on the real brain, that little mass right there. The hypothalamus lies below it, right? Now, encircling it, see how there's a little space? Encircling the thalamus right there. That space is called the third ventricle. So we have a lateral ventricle, third ventricle around the thalamus. Then there's a little duct that leads from this area through the, through the midbrain right here. This is the midbrain. And I know they don't have it identified, but that little part right there is the pineal gland, that little, little pea-sized structure right there. And the midbrain itself, the, the, really the roof of the midbrain had these little bumps on them. We have to identify them as well. And I just mentioned one of their names, superior colliculus a minute ago. So these are the superior and inferior colliculi, or what's called the corpora quadrigemina, forms the roof of the midbrain. This would be the floor of the midbrain on this side. This would be the roof. Now, if we follow that little duct down here, you see there's a space right here, just below the cerebellum, but above the medulla and the pons. That little cavity is called the fourth ventricle. So basically you have lateral ventricles, a third ventricle, and a fourth ventricle with some tubes that we have to look at. So this is just some generic introduction. What are some of the parts of the brain? We're gonna, I'm gonna bring up some of those names again in a minute, right? Now, um, I don't think they have this in the lab manual, but I thought it, it might be beneficial for people that are in lecture. So I left this slide in. You're not identifying all of this stuff. So when you go to look at the PowerPoint, that's, this is not, the reason why I left this in here. I left it in there really for two reasons. It'll help you out in lecture a little bit, but also we do have to cover this name, the Falk cerebri. Uh, cerebri. I'm gonna tell you what that is off the next picture. But ultimately we have cerebrospinal fluid that circles around our brain in this little space right here. So here's our brain tissue. On the outside of that is what we call the subarachnoid space, the actual space. Cerebrospinal fluid is formed from a filtration of blood somewhere. We don't know where yet, but I'm gonna show you. But the cerebrospinal fluid has to be reabsorbed back into the blood because the brain tissue is gonna use up all the nutrients out of it, like oxygen and, and glucose and all of that. And waste products are gonna be dumped in there. CO2 and uh, excess electrolytes and other waste products. So all of the cerebrospinal fluid would be flowing in this area here, at least one area, and then they would be reabsorbed by what are called arachnoid villi, these little special blood uh, tissue capillaries here. And then we have something called a sinus. The blue area is, a, is venous blood flow, and it goes from, from the back to the front of your, of your skull across the brain. So all of our used up CSF is being dumped back into venous blood flow in what's called the sinuses. There's a different name for them. Um, we're not identifying them here, but these are what we call the dural sinuses. And the one across the top of your skull is called the sagittal, superior sagittal sinus. Now, this is the only name that we actually have to cover in the lab, which is called the Falk cerebri. The brain itself and the spinal cord for that matter is surrounded by three different connective tissue layers. It anchors the, the nervous tissue in place, the brain and spinal cord in place, and it supports it. It's a, it's a protection. So ultimately the outermost layer of the connective tissue membranes that protect the brain and spinal cord, which are called the meninges, by the way. The outermost layer is called the dura mater. And so here's the dura mater, this green that the artist drew in. It's not really green in there. But the dura mater is non-elastic, very dense fibrous connective tissue. 
And there are some extensions of the dura mater that surround the brain. So if you notice here in this picture going down the front, we have a little, that dura mater connective tissue separates the two halves of the cerebrum from each other. So that connective tissue that separates the left and right cerebral hemispheres from each other is called the false cerebri. It's one of three extensions of what's called the dura mater. So there's another connective tissue layer just deep to the dura mater, it's called the arachnoid mater, which is this little line that you see right here where the arachnoid villi are located. Beneath that is what we call the subarachnoid space. That's where cerebrospinal fluid is flowing. And the innermost layer, which the artist drew in this little red line just on the surface of the, of the cerebrum itself, that's called the pia mater. That's the innermost layer, all right? So we have three meninges, and I'm sure you heard of meningitis before. Meningitis is an infection inflammation of the meninges. So, uh, you know, they have bacterial meningitis, which is really bad. Um, it's hard to treat. It's hard to get uh, our antibiotics in there. But if you catch it really quick, you know, the uh, outcome is, is pretty good. But people can die from it, right? Bacterial meningitis. Now you get immunizations for some of those bacteria. All right. Oh, I uh, forgot I had this picture in here. Here's a real section, the same view that we were looking at right here. This is just a graphic. Here's the, uh, here's the real section. Look at the superior sagittal sinus. This is a basically a large vein, runs along from front to back on your skull. All right. So what's, what's really good about this picture is they, can, they show the fault cerebri really well right here. It's going down what's called a uh, the central fissure down the brain that separates the right and left cerebral hemispheres. Now, on here. I don't think I'm seeing what you're seeing. I just see the lab manual page and I logged out and logged back, logged back in, but that's all I see. Oh, really? Is everybody seeing the PowerPoint? Can everybody still hear me? No, I don't see anything. You don't see anything? No, we don't see pictures. We just see the cranial wow. nerves from the. That's what I was asking earlier. Sometimes I have to stop sharing the screen. So that means I have to repeat everything. <laughs> All right, let me share the screen again. I thought Chris said y'all could see this PowerPoint. It went away. So you didn't. No, I remember, now I can see the PowerPoint. Oh. We were, I wasn't, we um, saw the study guide before, just the study guide. We didn't see this model oh. at all. Until okay. now, just now, literally now. So it's like, what are you pointing at? Or if you're even pointing at all, or just explain. Yes. So that last 20 minutes I'm talking, nobody saw any of this. Yeah. All right. Well, it's going to be in the video and it's going to be duplicated. I don't want to, I'm just going to rush through some of that stuff that I, I mentioned. I started with this picture. This is the PowerPoint I used in lecture. I modified the PowerPoint. I'm gonna post it in our Canvas site if I didn't do that already. I think I did, but I might not have, might've been in another section. But I was just going over the parts of the brain. So we have the cerebrum right here, the largest part of the brain, the cerebellum, the second largest mass of the brain, and then the, the diencephalon, which includes the thalamus in the middle, the hypothalamus below it, and then what's called the epithalamus where the pineal gland is located right there. Hanging off of the hypothalamus is the pituitary gland. Then that most inferior portion of our brain is what we call the brainstem. The cerebellum and the brainstem are your unconscious parts of our brain. Controls unconscious activities in our body. The brainstem is composed of the midbrain and the pons and the medulla oblongata, these three things. And then inferior to that is the spinal cord. Here's the real brain I was mentioning earlier. I knew you couldn't see it, which I didn't know. I wish I would have known that. Um, but you see the cerebrum, cerebellum, and the diencephalon right here, which includes the pineal gland at the top, which is also called the epithalamus, the thalamus in the middle, and the hypothalamus below it. The brainstem includes, and you can see how it looks on the real brain, 
the midbrain, where the superior and inferior colliculi are on the top of the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. Here are the holes in the brain I was mentioning if you were hearing that. We have holes in our brain filled with that cerebrospinal fluid. The holes that are in each cerebral hemisphere is called a lateral ventricle. There's one there. The space around the thalamus, around the diencephalon is called the third ventricle. Cerebrospinal fluid flows from the lateral ventricle to the third ventricle. Goes down through what's called the cerebral aqueduct. We can't see it too well right here into what's called the fourth ventricle. The fourth ventricle is below the cerebellum, but on the, the posterior or top part of the midbrain, the pons and the medulla at least. So that's what I was pointing out. Here's where I was mentioning the cranial meninges. So here is a frontal section of the brain through the skull. We can see the brain is surrounded by connective tissues, which are called the cranial meninges. It supports and protects the brain. The outermost meningeal layer is called the dura mater. It's green in this picture. It's not really green in there. Um, it then has three extensions that we're going to be learning. The first one here I mentioned earlier, the falx cerebri, is an extension from the dura mater that separates the, the left and right cerebral hemispheres from, from one another. Then just deep to the dura mater, the next layer, which the artist colors in this little purple area with the little, or where I was talking about the arachnoid villi, which I'm not going to go back over that, how we drain cerebrospinal fluid because we got to move forward. Um, the arachnoid villi is the next layer just deep to the dura mater, but just beneath the arachnoid mater is a space where the cerebrospinal fluid flows around our brain. That's called the subarachnoid space. And then surrounding and attaching to the surface of the brain directly is the innermost meningeal layers called the pia mater, right? Now, if we look at this picture, we can see, um, at least from a sagittal view, where the, menin uh, where the dura mater meningeal folds are that separate parts of the brain from one another. Here's the falx cerebri that I just mentioned. Now, this is a sagittal view. So the right side of the head is missing. We're looking at the left side of the head. So with the brain removed from here, we can see this sheet. This would separate the left side of the brain from the right side of the brain, which would be over here. That's the falx cerebri. The connective tissue, menin uh, dura mater meningeal fold that separates the cerebellum from the cerebrum is, well, at least what on the top, what we call the top, is called the tentorium cerebelli. The tentorium cerebelli separates specifically the cerebellum from the cerebrum. Now, I know we can't tell, but there are two cerebellar hemispheres that are separated on the posterior aspect from one another. So this little sheet still going in this medial sagittal view is called the falx cerebelli. The tentorum cerebelli, you are going to remember that because the tentorum is the top of the cerebellum. So, and just cerebelli just means the cerebellum. So the tentorum cerebelli separates the cerebellum from the cerebrum. The falx cerebelli separate the two cerebellar hemispheres from one another. Now, here's a little slide you can review. It talks about the blood-brain barrier that I mentioned earlier from our Engage manual. I did not put on here the astrocytes though. Um, the astrocytes are the cells in the brain that form the blood-brain barrier. And basically what they do is they surround the blood vessels that are in certain parts of the brain or I should say around the brain, there's no blood vessels that course through your brain directly. There are some special capillary beds in the cavities of the brain called the ventricles. But if you cut the brain open through one of the lobes, the brain will not bleed from the inside of itself because there's no blood vessels running through the brain tissue. So we have blood vessels on the outside of the brain 
and we have specialized capillary beds on the inside of these little cavities that we're about to cover. So the blood brain barrier basically protects the brain from harmful substances and pathogens and the like, right? And it's formed by the astrocytes. So let's go over the ventricles and look how where cerebrospinal fluid comes from and how it flows. If we look at uh, a transverse plane through the brain and the skull, and then look down the top of it, you would see this, all right? So this is anterior up here. This is where your, your face would be. This is the back of your head back here. Now you do see on here uh, at the level they cut this at, you see the part of the false cerebri right here. The false cerebri, if you remember, and up here at the top, the, part, the middle part's been cut out at this level. That is the dura mater meningeal fold that separates uh, the right and left cerebral hemispheres from one another. Now, what's interesting about this picture is in the middle of each cerebral hemisphere is a big hole. That's the cavity I was mentioning earlier. These are what we call the lateral ventricles. They're paired. There's one in the left and one in the right cerebral hemisphere. The little membrane that separates these two ventricles from one another would run across here and separate them. It's called the septum pellucidum. Embedded in the ventricles are specialized little bitty capillary beds right here. And the capillaries are lined by another neuroglial cell that have little cilia on them. And those cells are called ependymal cells. So here's your blood capillary right here. Blood's flowing through here. And so to get, to get your oxygen and your sugars and your other nutrients out of the blood without blood going to the brain directly, we filter the blood through these ependymal cells. The ependymal cells are filtering water and solutes from the blood. And then that clear kind of a yellow tentative fluid is called cerebrospinal fluid. So it's formed by what are called the choroid plexuses. A choroid plexus is a specialized capillary bed that is in the ventricles of the brain. This is what produces the CSF. The CSF basically is the life fluid for our brain and nerve and spinal cord and nervous tissue because there's no blood vessels running through this tissue. So we form the fluid in the cavities and then the fluid has to flow out of those cavities to get around the brain and around the spinal cord and also flow down the spinal cord in the middle. So here's a little schematic about where the CSF comes from. They come from these chlor choroid plexuses, which are found in the ventricles. We have the lateral ventricle in there in each cerebral hemisphere, there's a choroid plexus. The third ventricle is around the thalamus, there's a choroid plexus. The fourth ventricle is below the cerebellum, there's a choroid plexus. So starting up here, I'll just show you on the picture. The CSF can flow from the lateral ventricle. It's being formed in here. And there, remember, there is what's called the septum pellucidum. They're not showing it right here, but it separates the two lateral ventricles. There is a tiny little hole at the anterior side of that septum pellucidum. It's called an aperture. This is the or foramen. This is the interventricular foramen right here. So that little aperture or foramen allows the CSF to flow from the lateral ventricle into the third ventricular space. It's called the third ventricle flows around the thalamus. However, we're still making CSF in here. So that CFF, CSF can flow around there as well. Now connecting the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle is this little tube. It's a little bitty cavity tube that runs through the surface or more of the dorsum of the midbrain and across the ponds and through the brainstem. This is called the cerebral aqueduct. The aqueduct of the midbrain or cerebral aqueduct. So the CSF flows through there to the fourth ventricle. Now there's three little holes 
called the median and lateral apertures. You can't really identify them too well here, but there's two lateral apertures that would be on either side right here, because this is a 2D picture. It's really in, on 3D, there's one on the left and one on the right. Two little holes back there, and then one right in the middle underneath the cerebellum. So the CSF can flow from the fourth ventricle and escape to the subarachnoid space. Remember the subarachnoid space is on the outside around the cerebellum and around the cerebrum. So it is, that CSF escapes through the lateral apertures and the median aperture to the, to the subarachnoid space, flows around the brain and around the spinal cord because we have a subarachnoid space around the spinal cord. Um, the CSF can also flow down the center of the spinal cord because remember your spinal cord is hollow. It has a central canal that runs right down the middle of it. So that's where we make CSF and that's how CSF flows through the brain. Now I'm gonna talk about each one of these parts a little bit uh, on their own off of each slide. But we're gonna start with the, with the brainstem. The brainstem is made of the medulla. It's called the medulla oblongata, the pons in the midbrain. On this inferior view of the brain, uh, we'll be learning these, what, what's in yellow here in a little while. Those are all of the cranial nerves that we have to identify. But we have the midbrain would be here, the pons is here, and then the medulla is that last little bump before we get to the spinal cord. So the medulla oblongata is continuous with the superior portion of the spinal cord. So the spinal cord would run down here and then just above it attaching to the brainstem, it would attach at what we call the medulla oblongata. So we have a transverse section through the medulla oblongata here, right? And that's what you're looking at. These little yellow things are different areas where cranial nerves enter and leave the brainstem, at least at this, at this level. Now I do want to point out, well, first of all, the medulla oblongata along with the rest of the brainstem is an unconscious part of the brain. So there are tracks of neurons that go up and down the spinal cord to and from the brain. I should also mention this. I don't know if I mentioned this last week or not. There's no nerves in the brain at all or in the spinal cord. Nerves only exist on the outside of the brain and on the outside of the spinal cord because nerves are connective tissue wrappings of neurons and there's no connective tissue on the inside of our spinal cord and brain, right? But we do have a lot of neurons coursing in the same path. And when neurons course in the same path, it's called a tract. So what you're looking at here is something called the decussation of pyramids. Right here, you see how these tracks crisscross. About 85% of the neurons going up and down the spinal cord to and from the brain crisscross at what's called the decussation of pyramids at the medulla oblongata. Now, the reason why I'm pointing that out is because the motor neurons that leave the brain, your cerebrum, and come down through the brain stem and then enter the spinal cord after the medulla a lot of them crisscross from your right side of your brain to the left side of the body and vice versa. So for that reason, the left cerebral hemisphere controls the muscles on the right side of your body and vice versa. The right cerebral hemisphere controls the muscles on your left side of the body because those neurons are crisscrossing right there at what's called the decussation of pyramids. So the medulla is a passageway for neurons, sensory and motor neurons to go up and down to and from the brain. But there's also gray matter areas in here that control different aspects of our physiology. There are some respiratory centers in there that allow for the regulation of respiration, right? Um, and other vital body functions. Here, I put a couple of things where you can find, I don't think we have to, in lab, you have to cover the olivary nuclei. 
they're involved in uh, auditory uh, uh, reflexes. But I do think we, you do have to know the pyramids. That's why I put that there because they're gonna ask you questions like how come the left side of the cerebrum controls the right side of the body and vice versa because of the decussation of pyramids, the neurons crisscross at the medulla right there, all right? Now I put in here some of the functions, heart rate, respiratory rate, that's because there are special gray matter areas in the medulla that can fire off reflex uh, nerve impulses ultimately to go to the heart we can increase and decrease heart rate we're going to talk more about this in amp2 specifically but uh and vasoconstriction swallowing coughing so just know these basic functions all right the next part of the brain stem is called the pons again it's an unconscious part of the brain it still allows for uh neurons to pass up and down the spinal cord to and from different parts of the brain and now also including the cerebellum. So the pons is receiving neurons from the medulla. Some neurons go to and from the cerebellum. Some neurons go to and from the cerebrum. So it helps connect all the different parts of the brain together. So we can have complete communication. The pons itself, like the medulla, unconscious part of the brain, have some very specific areas that can control things like respiration. Again, we're covering in AMP2. But it also has neurons that relays messages to and from the cerebellum and the cerebrum for the control of voluntary actions of skeletal muscles, which I'll mention a little bit more about voluntary muscle regulation in a minute when we talk about the cerebellum. The midbrain, which looks really strange on this picture, is the very most superior portion of the brainstem, right? Now, the midbrain itself, we're looking at from this picture, which is kind of strange, we're looking at the roof of it. So if you look down onto the, the midbrain directly from the top, I know it because ours is straight down is from the back, but we're looking at the top or the roof of the midbrain right here. Now notice, I said earlier, we have something called the tentorum cerebelli that separates the cerebellum from the cerebrum really at this area. So below there is the roof of the membrane and it's called the tectum. The tectum is made up of these four rounded elevations you see right here. Those four, <coughs> excuse me, those four rounded elevations are called the corpora quadrigemina. Quadrigemina because quad means four. The two superior elevations are referred to as a superior colliculi. The superior colliculi, as you'll see in your engage manual, is involved in visual reflexes that control the upper trunk and head muscles. So if you see something kind of scary or in like your peripheral vision, you turn real quick from, a, from you seeing something, that reflex is being initiated from the superior colliculi. On the other hand, the two inferior elevations that we see of the, of the corpora quadrigemina are called the inferior colliculi. The inferior colliculi are involved in auditory or hearing reflexes that would regulate your upper trunk and head muscles. An easy way to remember this is think about somebody coming up behind you and you don't know they're there and they clap really hard, really like you turn your head. Well, why did you turn your head that way? Well, because you heard something and the reflex was initiated at the inferior colliculus. So those are the corporate quadrigemina. Now lying just above that is the pineal gland. Um, the pineal gland produces melatonin. And I'm sure some of y'all heard of that. We're not gonna learn all that right now. We're gonna do it in AMP2. I just mention it now because we see it. And you know, melatonin, uh, at least in part of its functions, helps makes us sleepy. Some people take it as a sleep aid. Uh, 
and whatnot. Here's another view of the midbrain at uh, really a transverse plane. And we're looking at the, this would be the roof or what's called the tectum. The little bumps up there on the roof are the corpora quadrigemina, but since we don't see all four elevations, we only see the superior ones right here. Those are the superior colliculi involved in those visual reflexes. Then down here on the, the floor or the bottom of the midbrain, and you can identify these on a sheet brain, by the way, the dissection, these are called the cerebral peduncles, large masses of neuron fibers that go back up and down through the midbrain to and from the cerebrum. Um, so I put down some of the, the functions right here, conveys motor impulses uh, to and from cerebrum and the cerebellum. That's that communication I was re referring to earlier. Uh, spinal uh, impulses from the spinal cord to and from the thalamus. Um, the superior and inferior colliculi regulate auditory and visual reflexes as I was referring to before. Um, just, you have to know that the superior ones are for visual, the inferior ones are for auditory. Um, I don't know why I left this in here. We don't really need to know about the reticular formation, but the reticular form, I'll just mention it. The reticular formation are groups of neurons that run down through the brainstem and interconnect the cerebellum and your cerebrum all together. And the reticular formation is the part of the brain that in part is involved in causing us to wake up after when we're sleeping on the verge of waking up. All of a sudden, like your alarm clock starts to go off. Sometimes you wake up before your alarm clock goes off. You know, your uh, reticular formation is involved in waking you up from a deep sleep. The other thing I wanted to point out is I left these tables in here, just in case if you're not in, you know, my lecture or whatnot, because in lecture, we have a little bit more detail that we have to cover. You don't have to go through and learn all of this detail for lab. The text information for the functions of each part of the brain is in your engaged lab manual. But this will definitely help you out in lecture uh, because you can learn everything you want to know about each part of the brain off of these tables that are in the lecture book. And I really like them. That's why I, I left them in there. All right, let's go over the cerebellum. The cerebellum is an unconscious part of the brain. It is... Uh, inferior and posterior to uh, the cerebrum in its cranial cavity. There actually are a couple of lobes uh, of the cerebellum that you see here. And in the middle, there are bands of neurons that interconnect the lobes together, which is called a vermis. Now we're not gonna do the posterior and uh, the flucolonodular uh, lobes and all of that. We're not doing that in the lab right? But we ju you just have to know vermis. We have to be able to identify it. Basically, these are bands of neurons that help interconnect both cerebellar hemispheres to one another. Now, what do we have to know about the cerebellum and, and what do we have to identify really, like on the practical and stuff like that? Well, if you notice, the cerebellum has darker tissue along the perimeter, which is the, what we really call the cortical region, the cortex area of the cerebellum. And then there's some white tissue in the middle. Now I know this is just a drawing, but the, the gray matter that we see in here is called the folia. That's all the gray matter area of the cerebellum. The white matter areas that spread all through the folia is called the arbor vitae. That's the white matter. The word arbor vitae is tree of life. So the tree of life is goes up and down as the white matter through the cerebellum, right? Now, the cerebellum is involved in controlling in an unconscious way skeletal muscle contraction and relaxation. Now, notice what I just said. It controls or regulates skeletal muscle contraction in an unconscious way. That should sound strange to you all right now because our skeletal muscles are consciously regulated, right? Well, that's true. They are consciously regulated from the cerebrum, 
That means you have conscious control over when you contract a muscle and move a body part. However, what I have not told you all yet, and I don't know if your teacher and lecturer has, has brought it up or anything, but when we are contracting our skeletal muscles, there's always a feedback. Feedback information that, come, that feeds back to the cerebellum and the cerebellum is always analyzing the outcome of skeletal muscle contraction. Was the outcome the intended outcome? Or do we have to make a very quick adjustment? For instance, if you're walking down the road and you're not paying attention and all of a sudden at the very last second, there's a hole there, a pothole, and you start to go into the pothole, you then have to readjust your balance and you don't fall in it, but you kind of, you stepped on it a little bit and started to, to feel the hole. You, you change your muscle contraction. You change your balance points. All of that is very quick interactions from the cerebellum to your cerebrum and back to your, your skeletal muscles. So the cerebrum helps normalize and regulate our muscle activity to make sure our movements are smooth and coordinated but it is an unconscious part of the brain so our muscle tone our posture and our balance all help are regulated in part by the cerebellum now the diencephalon is made up of these three things on this picture we can identify where they are it's made up of the thalamus in the middle it's made up of the tissue below the thalamus called the hypothalamus. And it's made of the tissue that's, it's really on in us on the posterior part, but we always call it the top of the thalamus. This is the area where the pineal gland is located right there, just above the superior colliculus, by the way. Here, here's the corporate quadrigemina right here. That's a superior and inferior colliculi. Just above that is a pineal gland that produces melatonin. So, we, and it's also called the epithalamus. So we have the epithalamus or pineal gland, thalamus and hypothalamus. The thalamus itself is made up of two lobes. We're not learning all of these, what are called the nuclei. There are several different areas of nuclei in these lobes of the thalamus that regulate different aspects of sensation and sensation reflexes. What's important about the thalamus is that the thalamus in the very middle of the cerebrum at the bottom and really in the middle of it is a big stoplight. It's a, like a four-way stop where all sensory information, neurons carrying sensory information up to the thalamus from the spinal cord through the, through the brainstem to the thalamus. The thalamus has the job of redirecting the specific sensory inputs to the various lobes of the cerebrum where they are analyzed and then received in a conscious way. So basically, the thalamus is a big relay center for all sensory stimuli except for the sense of smell, olfaction, vision, taste. Uh, uh, tactile stimulation, pain, all sorts of stimulation, everything except for our sense of smell comes up to the thalamus and then the part of the thalamus responsible for that particular stimulation sends that sensory input to the appropriate part of the cerebrum. So this thalamus is a big sensory relay center is basically what it is for everything except for smell. Now, the hypothalamus is very similar. There's a whole bunch of different little collections of neuron cell bodies. They're called nuclei. We're not learning all of these nuclei. We're going to learn more about the hypothalamus in AMP2. For now, you just have to know that it's involved in regulating almost all of our homeostatic uh, activities in our body. It actually is part of the nervous system and the endocrine system. So it helps relay motor outputs and, and sensory inputs um, for the nervous system, but it also is involved in producing hormones, specifically from these two lower nuclei right here. 
These two lower nuclei, the suprachiasmatic and the supraoptic nucleus right here, they actually produce hormones that control the pituitary gland. So for that reason, the hypothalamus is really controlling all of our homeostasis via the nervous system reflexes and hormonal reflexes for that matter, right? And then the epithalamus again, uh, there's a term in here for one of the nuclei that we're not covering in lab. I just didn't want to change the slide. Uh, the slide, the Habenuller nu uh, nucleus in here is involved in olfaction. Um, no, in fact, I, I think it is in our lab manual. You'll see it in the lab manual. The Habenuller nu uh, nucleus is one of the nuclei in the epithalamus. It's actually right above the pineal gland, just above the pineal gland is the Habenuller nucleus. That's going to help in, be involved in olfaction reflexes, a sense of smell. So if you smell something and it smells really bad, you kind of squint your eyes and it, ooh, you go like that, ooh. That, you know, that's some of the reflex that's involved with that. Now, what about around those ventricles and around the, uh, the diencephalon? Well, those are uh, the, the organs and, and structures that I call the circumventricular organs that are not protected by the blood-brain barrier I mentioned earlier. So you just have to know the three that there are, the hypothalamus, not protected, the pineal gland, and the pituitary gland. Those are the circumventricular organs. Um, these are the areas that help coordinate activities, all the, the homeostatic activities in our body via the endocrine system and the nervous system, as I was mentioning before, predominantly because the hypothalamus controls, part of it controls the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is uh, a master gland in the endocrine system in our body. And then we also have the pineal gland, which produces a hormone embedded in our brain at the roof of the third ventricle, right? Here's a little uh, uh, table again, has a little bit more information in it. Uh, for the thalamus, the hypothalamus and the epithalamus, you, you can review this. Some of this information is exactly what's in our lab manual, not all of it, but most of it. And then you see on these little pictures how it's been falsely colored where the, the little areas are located, helps you identify where they are. All right, so the last couple things that we have to do in this chapter is cover the cerebrum, look at the lobes of the cerebrum, what the cerebrum is, look at the lobes and what some of the areas are and the types of reflexes they're involved with. And the very last thing at the back of the chapter is covering the cranial nerves. And I'll talk about them in a little bit. So the cerebrum is the largest mass on the brain. It can take up anywhere to 80, to 85% of the volume of the brain. I think in the lab manual, they, they say it's 83%. I'm not gonna put 83% on the practical, but you know that, that's a big number, right? So it's the largest part. Um, it's made up of gray matter and white matter, just like uh, the spinal cord and the cerebellum is, white matter and gray matter areas. Those areas all in our cerebrum have no nerves in it, but there's billions of neurons everywhere. And those neurons are constructed in such a way that they can communicate to different parts of the cerebrum, different parts of the brain, and then up and down the spinal cord so the neurons can go out to the body. The brain itself is composed of large elevated areas of gray matter called gyri. I'm gonna show you that in a second on the picture. Then we have fissures in, that separate the lobes of the brain and separating each raised area of the cerebral cortex from each other are what we call salsi, salsi on the cerebral cortex. Now, the gray matter is in the cerebral cortex. The white matter is isolated in the middle of the cerebrum, right? So we actually have two cerebral hemispheres. I'm gonna tell you what this uh, corpus callosum is off of this picture, no, the next picture. Um, so we can see it, but here we can see the cerebrum, all the little squiggly raised areas, those would be called the gyri. The indented areas between the gyri are called salsi or sulcus singular. We have a fissure running down the central 
sagittal area of the brain separating the right from the left cerebral hemispheres. That's called the longitudinal fissure. Running down through that longitudinal fissure is where the false cerebri would be located. Remember, that's one of the extensions from the dura mater. And then we have different lobes on the cerebrum. Take on the same names of the cranial bones you learned for uh, when you learned the cranium, the skull. Frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe. You can't see it, but there's a temporal lobe down there as well. All right. Now, if you look at a little section through the brain, through the cerebrum, you can see the gray matter is isolated to the outside and the white matter is on the inside. This gray matter is in what's called the cerebral cortex. And it is your conscious brain. Out here in the, in the darker area is where you think, see, smell, feel, taste, control muscle action. I want to go work out. I want to run on a treadmill. I want to read a book. I want to learn. I'm playing music. I'm writing a poem. All of, that, all of those activities, conscious activities, come from your gray matter in your cerebral cortex. The white matter areas are the, area, are the unconscious areas. And basically, it's a, it allows for neurons to go to and from different parts of the cerebral cortex and up and down through the brain. That's what the white matter area is for. So here you can see the lobes of the brain, frontal lobe. We also have something called the prefrontal lobe, which I'll mention in a minute. But we have the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe right here, the temporal lobe here. And... There's an area that I want to point out. Now, we do have these little fissures along, or, or, or salsi, I should say, along separating these gyri from each other. See how we have these raised areas? Those are the gyri. In between them are the fissures. So there's several different little, I keep saying fissure, little indentations called the salsi. So there's one that is vitally important because we have to, you have to learn what these two gyri do right here. And so the, the sulcus that goes down the middle separating the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe is called the central sulcus, right? The central sulcus. Just in front of the central sulcus is a gyrus. Notice I said gyrus, that singular gyri would be plural. So this gyrus that's in front of the sulcus is called the pre-central gyrus. The gyrus that is just behind the sulcus is called the post-central gyrus. The pre-central gyrus is where all of your information comes from to control your skeletal muscles. It's called the primary motor area. So... This pre-central gyrus is involved in regulating skeletal muscle contraction, right? The post-central gyrus is where you feel everything along the different areas of our brain, our somatic senses. It's called the somatosensory area. You feel pain, you feel hot, you feel cold, you feel pressure, touch. All in this gyrus is called the the uh, Post-central gyrus is the primary somatosensory area, all right? All right, um, let's go over uh, the areas of, oh, they just talk about sensory neurons and motor neurons coming in and out and association neurons, areas in the brain. Let's talk about some of these areas. I just mentioned the motor and sensory, one of them um, in the brain. So here is a schematic of the functional areas of the cerebrum. You are not learning every one of these little dots that you see. There are a couple of them that are in the lab manual that I, I want you to learn for sure because they're in there. And so I'm going to point them out for you. So first of all, we have the frontal lobe right here. The frontal lobe also has what's called the prefrontal lobe right in the front. As it turns out in humans, the prefrontal lobe area is well organized. This is where we have, be, our, you know, we have thoughts of our behavioral patterns, our personality, 
the ability to learn and all of that is in our comes from our prefrontal cortex. People that have major damage to this prefrontal cortex, they actually uh, change their personalities. They become like a different person. It's kind of strange, but it's because of the damage in this frontal lobe and the prefrontal cortex. Now, let me go through and find these areas. Okay, so first of all, here are the two main areas. Here's our central sulcus. Here's our precentral gyrus and our postcentral gyrus. This is the precentral gyrus is your primary motor area right here. This is basically where all of the information is, is finally going to leave the brain to go down your spinal cord or your brain out of a cranial nerve, basically to control skeletal muscle contraction. The postcentral gyrus is the area for your somatosensory area, your primary somatosensory area. Ow, I, I poked my finger with a needle. I stuck my finger in boiling water, it's hot. I feel pressure, touch, vibration, tickle. Somatosensory areas. You also have to know the Broca's speech area. The Broca's speech area in the frontal lobe is the area that is involved in allowing us to be able to form speech. So we form words in that area. And people, that's what I was mentioning earlier, people who have damage to this area of their brain, typically on the left side, from a stroke, they can understand what you're saying, but they, can, they can't form words because this is the area that's involved in the motor aspect that controls all the muscles that allow us to form speech patterns through our, our vocal cords, right? Now, we also have in the temporal lobe something called the Wernicke's area. So the Wernicke's area in the temporal lobe is the area that allows us to have the sense of smell and auditory sensation. The Wernicke's area allows us, I'm sorry, the temporal lobe is where you smell and you hear in your temporal lobe. The Wernicke's area is the area where words are processed. Like you are understanding the terms I'm using right now and you're putting meaning to say the word cerebrum. You picture the cerebrum in your head. These are the association areas that allow us to understand words. And so people who have damage to that area cannot comprehend exactly what you're saying, even though they are hearing the words that it, it's to them in our, in our lab manual, they refer to it as a word salad. It's called receptive aphasia. So if, in other words, if I say the house is blue, someone with damage there might hear blue house is the they can't put the words in the correct order. They don't understand exactly the meaning behind the words that, that are being spoken. So all of that in the temporal lobe is dealing with the uh, ability to smell, understand language, and hear, all from our temporal lobe. The occipital lobe is the area in the back of our cerebrum that has the primary visual cortex. This is where you're seeing the screen right now, way in the back of your brain in what's called the occipital lobe, right? All right, and then in the parietal lobe up here is where we have our primary somatosensory area. So that's the main important thing about that. Now there's a couple of tables here. Go over the functions of the cerebrum Basically, this is a generic uh, description of it. And I also included this table that covers the, the distinction between right-brained and left-brained individuals. I don't know if you know what that, if you ever heard of that, but that's actually called hemispheric lateralization. And it's because in the right side of our brain is where we typically respond, have neurons that respond to music and art spatial pattern 
perception and recognition. So people that have a well-developed right cerebral hemisphere are more of your musicians and artists and things like that. Left-brained individuals respond to language and numbers and scientific skills very, very, very well. So these are more of uh, your accountants, uh, your doctors, your lawyers, and things like that. I'm not saying you don't have people that are both. You do. I'm just trying to simplify it a little bit. So right-brained individuals are, are heavy right-brained individuals are typically more artsy. Left-brained individuals are typically more straightforward with reasoning and data. Oh, here are the facts about, you know, you know, something like that. So, but people have a little bit of both, you know. Then the last part in this packet, which I left in here, are the tables for the cranial nerves. You have to know the cranial nerves by name and number, and you have to know a little bit about them. For instance, you have to know if the cranial nerve is carrying sensory information, motor information, or both. So the first cranial nerve, and notice they're in Roman numerals right here. The first cranial nerve is the olfactory nerve. That's the, the nerve that allows you to smell olfaction. It only carries sensory information in. The optic nerve for vision only carries sensory information in. The next several have uh, some nerve fibers that are going to be involved in controlling eye movement along with some other movements, but the oculomotor nerve is a motor nerve, motor, have only motor neurons. Those motor neurons are involved in moving our eyes and our eyelids and controlling our pupil size. So when a doctor shines a light in your eye and the pupil gets smaller, that means the oculomotor nerve, which is coming off of the midbrain, by the way, um, it, that, that pathway is still functional. So doctors, you know, and whatnot do these little reflexes to see if the nerve pathways are still intact if someone had some sort of a neurological trauma, hit their head or something like that. The trochlear nerve, same thing. It only contains motor neurons controlling the movements of our eyeball. The trigeminal nerve is a mixed nerve. It contains sensory and motor neurons, so forth and so on, right? So it's in these two tables. So there's 12 pair of cranial nerves. We're about to learn how to identify them. Um, and you should review this. All the information is in your engage manual as well that you need to know. I did leave this in here. Um, this is a mnemonic on how to remember the cranial nerves. Um, if you don't know what a mnemonic is, it's a, it's a word saying that you say, and because it's easier you can memorize a, a phrase or a string of words. And then you take the first letter of that word and it's the first letter of the word that you're trying to relate it to. So for instance, this one says, oh, 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 to touch and feel very green vegetables, ah. So the first three cranial nerves, olfactory, optic, and oculomotor. That's why it's O and O and O, all right? Um, when I was in your place, I learned, I still remember it. It's kind of silly. I didn't know what the teacher was talking about. I thought he was a little crazy, but he, he said one and it's so crazy. I still remember it on old Olympus towering tops, a fin view Germans viewing a hawk. Now that one's kind of silly, right? But I don't know. I still remembered it, but I'll tell you what, you have to know how, how to put these cranial nerves in order, right? So that's what we're going to be uh, looking at. The last thing I, I left in here, some animations. You have to be connected to the, uh, the internet and animations and overviews of each cranial nerve. That's why there's so many more slides in here that I'm not covering specifically. You could review these things at home, all right? You know, trochlear cranial nerve four, the trigeminal cranial nerve five. And notice it's Roman numerals. The abducens is six. Facial seven, vestibulocochlear is eight, glossopharyngeal is nine, vagus is 10, accessory 11, and hypoglossal is 12. So we have to know those, right? And you can learn them from this mnemonic. 
All right, so let me stop sharing this screen. Is everybody still with me? Or did everybody mute me? Yep, yep. Very good. All right, now what I wanna do is I want to pull up the Quizlet. <clears throat> I put the link in our exercise nine module, but it's the same link from one of the other modules, like in the muscle chapter module. And you just kind of scroll up and down. Like next week, you're going to be learning all the models of the inner ear structure, the ear model and all of that. Um, this week, you're specifically doing the brain. So what I want to do is pull this up because when you go to look at it, it it's, it's going to look kind of, you know, hairy because there's so many circles on it. Where does each circle go, right? So, <clears throat> excuse me, this particular model is here specifically to allow you to be able to identify the cranial nerves. So let's go over what they are, all right? So starting up here at the top, of course they have a, some of the lobes labeled, but um, you, could, you can look at those, you know, later or temporal lobe, frontal lobe, whatever. I'm just gonna cover the actual nerves that we see. So the nerves are really these things, like here, and 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 you know, all of those. So let's go over them. This little thing right here, number two is point two, is called the olfactory bulb, which is cranial nerve number one. And notice uh, it says CN1, cranial nerve one. You should also, you should know the Roman numerals for those. I'm sure you know your Roman numerals. If not, you can look in the little PowerPoint. Now, what is leading from this bulb? Oh, by the way, on the, that inferior view of the skull that you guys identified on this last practical, remember the Christogaly and the cribriform plate? That's, that's the roof of the ethmoid bone? Well, these little bulbs sit on that cribriform plate. There's a cribriform plate on the skull would be right there. Now, leading from the bulb are neurons that go down what's called the olfactory tract. So this is called a tract right here. Oh, he just put the nerve again, but specifically this is called the tract and this is called the bulb. It's actually two parts of the same cranial nerve, right? And technically this is not a nerve per se, it's a tract because there's no nerves that run in your brain tissue. The nerves are actually running up through the cribriform plate into the into the olfactory bulb you just don't see that but i won't be that picky on the test you say cranial nerve one fine olfactory nerve cranial nerve number two is actually cut this little cut right here the nerve would come off and attach to your eyeball up here this one was cut it was attached to the eyeball up here hold on one second All right, sorry about that. So this is cranial nerve two, it's the optic nerve. So this is where the optic nerve is cut. This little area between them is where the neurons from the right nerve crisscrosses to the left side of the brain and the nerve, the neurons from the left side of your brain crisscrosses over to the right side of the brain. That is called the optic chiasm. In Latin, a chiasm is a crossing over crossing. So that's called the optic, optic chiasm right in the middle. And then this is the optic tract right here it goes into the brain, specifically would radiate to the occipital lobe where we see everything. So that's the first three cranial nerve, the first two cranial nerves. The third cranial nerve is this little, these two little bumps right there coming off of where the midbrain's at. So this is all the midbrain region right here. This is the pons and then this little bump down here is the medulla oblongata. So coming off of this midbrain is that oculomotor nerve. So you have to follow that. I'm assuming it's that one. No, it's point. So that's why I got to go over them with you. 
you're gonna have to blow it up at home. See, number five is pointing, that line is going to the pituitary gland. So this one's going here. Cranial nerve three, the oculomotor nerve, all right? So that's that one. Now, the fourth cranial nerve comes off the junction between the midbrain, that's the midbrain, and the pond. So it's actually coursing from just in this little crevice coming back up. So this little, looks like a little string right there. That's cranial nerve four. So is this one. That's the same nerve. Remember, they're paired. These are paired nerves. So that's the trochlear nerve, cranial nerve number four. Cranial nerve five is the next one down. It's this little bump. So that bump and this bump are the same. That's called the trigeminal nerve. Let's see which one is in here. Trigeminal is this one. The sixth cranial nerve is called the abducens. The abducens is, move out the way, is this nerve right here. So it would go cranial nerve six, abducens, cranial nerve seven, the facial nerve, cranial nerve eight, the vestibulocochlear nerve, All right? So if you look at them, we go uh, abducens, six, seven is facial, eight is vestibulocochlear, nine, sorry, is a glossopharyngeal nerve, 10 is the vagus nerve, the accessory nerve, and then uh, the hypoglossal nerve. So here's how you count them. Six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12, right? So again, you have the vestibulocochlear, the glossopharyngeal, the vagus, the accessory, and the and the hypo. I'm sorry, the hypoglossal over here. Right. On the practical, you want it all written um, like C and ten, and then the the name. Um, on the practical, if you, yeah, I, I would like for you to know the name uh, instead of just C and one or C and two. Like for instance, if sorry, if we have. Uh, say they're pointing to this nerve right here, see, and they're paired, this same one over here, right? Uh, you could say uh, CN12 glossopharyngeal, you know what I mean? Or this one, the CN11 accessory, right? Cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve, or CN10 vagus nerve, something like that. You follow what I'm saying? Yes. I would like for you to know that because you're going to have to know the name and number anyway on the physiology test, right? You have to know the name and number. So the way you count them is this. Cranial nerve one actually has two parts to it. It's the olfactory nerve. There's the bulb and then the tract. But I'm assuming since, you know, Blaylock just put the nerve on there, you could just put the cranial nerve one olfactory. Technically, it's the bulb and the tract. Then you have the optic nerve, the optic chiasm, and the optic tract right here. Nerve, and that's a, this is the, the right one, this is the left one. They crisscross in the middle to go to opposite sides of the brain. That's why from your left eyeball, the majority of the visual field from your left eyeball, you're seeing on the right side of your brain and vice versa. Now the visual fields do overlap. I'm not going to get into that right now, but anyway, so there's different parts of some of them, but this is cranial nerve two, cranial nerve three, oculomotor there, uh, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. That's how you count them, right? All right. Now the, let me go back one. Let me just show you this real quick. Here's the, the sagittal view of the brain. Um, I know it's kind of blurry, but you can see all like the, the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe. It's the different areas of the brain. That's what these are, frontal, 
parietal, occipital, right? But what about all this other stuff we can identify? Well, connect, interconnecting the left and right cerebral hemispheres are neurons that crisscross back and forth to each cerebral hemisphere, right? Um, that little nervous tissue there that's connecting the two cerebral hemispheres is referred to as the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum. Now you don't have to know the fornix and the and the um, and the I mean the rostrum and the posterior part. That's why they're not circled. Just know the whole thing as what's called the corpus callosum. The the bottom tissue right there is called the fornix. So that that's how you say that fornix, corpus callosum. Now this little tissue in the middle is the septum pellucidum I mentioned earlier. So if this tissue was was broken away you would see the lateral ventricle in there. And so to, coming from the lateral ventricle, the cerebral spinal fluid would have to go through a little bitty hole right there, which we can't see on the model, but that would be called the ventricular foramen. And the CSF would flow into this space right here. This would be the third ventricle around the thalamus. This is the thalamus, this is the hypothalamus, and the pituitary gland always hangs off of the hypothalamus. This is the pineal gland right here, also called the epithalamus. And then we have the midbrain right here, not this bump, but here's the roof of it. And here's the floor of it down here. In fact, you can see right there is a cranial nerve number uh, four. That's a trochlear nerve right there, right? Um, that little line that you see right there. Now, off of the other side. The roof of the midbrain contains these, these little elevations. Remember, there's four of them called the corpora quadrigemina. The two superior little elevations are called the superior colliculi, and the two lower elevations are called the inferior colliculi. Superior colliculus, inferior colliculus. If you put US on the end, it means singular. If I'm talking about both of them, both of them collectively, I would say colliculi would be plural. Um, we have the cerebellum, right? You can see the arbor vitae is all the white in here. That's the white matter. And then the gray matter, if they point to it, which I'm, I'm really not pointing to it, but the arbor vitae is the white matter. The gray matter little area right there around the white is called the folia. folia. And then the fourth ventricle is below the cere cerebellum. Or oh, did I call that cerebellum? I meant cerebellum. Below the cerebellum is the fourth ventricle. And then we have the rest of the brainstem from the midbrain. We have the pons, the big bump, just behind it, that little gradual bump, whoops. That little gradual bump right there is the medulla oblongata and then the spinal cord, all right? All right. Um, now I'm gonna try and do a, a quick Google search. I have one last thing I want to do before I let y'all go for the day and field your questions. So let me know if you can't see the screen. All right. Can everybody see the sheet brain pictures? Did somebody say yes? Yes. All right. I didn't know if I had to stop sharing again. All right, so um, I'm just gonna pick a couple here. All right, here is a sagittal view of the sheep brain. I don't know if you've seen them yet on, on your pre or post lab assignments. Um, I hadn't gone through all of those questions as of yet, but I just wanted to make sure I went through this because I know that they, they're gonna have a sheep brain on there. I want you to be able to identify the parts. And it actually is not as hard as you, you think if you know where the parts are supposed to be already. Now it looks a little different than the human brain because the midbrain area and the spinal cord are more in a, in a longitudinal fashion because remember a sheep walks on all fours. They're not standing upright, but the cerebrum is this large part here. The cerebellum is this part. You see the little arbor vitae in there, all the white matter, the foley is the gray matter. Um, this is the thalamus. This is, they don't have this labeled, but um, this is not a very clear picture of it, but that 
right inside of there would be the lateral ventricle and that's a portion of the septum pellucidum in there. I'm gonna find a better picture in a second. Let's identify the, the large stuff that we can. So here is the thalamus, the large round mass right below that fornix, uh, you know, of the, of the cerebrum. Below that is what we call the hypothalamus. Now the pituitary gland is missing. Sometimes it's missing. Sometimes it's on there. But then all of a sudden you see a round elevation over here. That's the cross section through the optic nerve, right down the middle of where the optic chiasm would be. All right. So you had the optic nerve, the hypothalamus, the thalamus. You then have the pineal gland. And right behind it, you see this large rounded elevation. That large rounded elevation is the superior colliculus. The little bitty bump below it right there is the inferior colliculus, right? So pineal gland, superior and inferior colliculi. Now from the lateral ventricle, the CSF goes into the third ventricle. The third ventricle runs around the thalamus. It's connected to the fourth ventricle via this duct. It's called the cerebral aqueduct, which would go into the, into the ventricle that lies below the cerebellum. And that's continuous with the central canal of the spinal cord. This is the spinal cord back here, and that's the central canal. So we have the midbrain area. Remember, because the corpora quadrigemina is the roof of the midbrain, so that's the midbrain. So the next bump that we see would be the pons. And then the next bump that's elongated is the medulla oblongata because it's oblong right there. Let me see if I can see another picture. Um, this one has, looks like it has it on there pretty good. All right, even though it's smaller, uh, here's your cerebrum again. Here that, here that white tissue at the top is the corpus callosum right there. The tissue below it is called the fornix, even though they don't have it labeled. And so in between them is that sheet, that tissue right there is the septum pellucidum. If it was open, you would see a cavity in there, but it's not open. Then on this one, you can see the thalamus right here. The hypothalamus is here. And then this one has the, the pituitary gland is attached to it. The optic chiasm, it would be right in front of that, but it's being blocked by the pituitary gland. Um, we have the third ventricle around the thalamus. You have the cerebral aqueduct, which leads to the fourth ventricle under the, the cerebellum. You have the cerebellum. Um, you have the pons, the first little bump, and then the medulla oblongata is that last little bump until you, when it goes in like that, then it, that's the spinal cord below it. I want to find a dorsal view to show you the corpora quadrigemina, though. Um, oh, here's a here's a view, inferior view. Uh, here are the olfactory bulbs right here, by the way. I was mentioning earlier for cranial nerve one, and then that little line right there is the olfactory tract. Um, this is the optic nerve here from the right eye and one from the left eye, they crisscross at the optic chiasm, and those would be the optic tracks right there. Um, I, we didn't do the mammillary body, but the mammillary body is a little area that's involved in uh, sensations of smell that might be in our lab manual. I, I'm not positive, but if you have to identify it, that's called the mammillary body. And then there's a little piece right behind, this is the bottom of the hypothalamus, by the way, just behind the optic chiasm. And there's a little stalk of tissue that holds a pituitary to the bottom part of the brain. Of course, the pituitary is missing, but the stalk of tissue is also being cut. It's right there, it's called the infidibulum. I'm not sure if we have to know that. Now on uh, the midbrain itself, on the bottom of the midbrain, I said you uh, earlier today, I said you could see the cerebral peduncles. Well, you see how you have these large rounded masses of tissue right here on the bottom of the brain. These are the cerebral peduncles. That's the floor of the, of the midbrain. The roof of the midbrain is on the other side. Now I did want to point out um, you, that little line that you see right there, 
that is cranial nerve number four. That's a trochlear nerve right there. Cranial nerve number five would be this large, more rounded elevation that comes off of the pons. So you can't see them too well on this dissection, but I just wanted to point out the cerebral peduncle. So this big area right here is the pons. The next elevation that's elongated is the medulla right there. And then the spinal cord. Just to give you another view. I want to see the dorsal view of the brain so I can tell you what the baby's butt is. It won't make sense unless I have a dorsal dissection. Hmm. I know I couldn't have been the only one that ever did a dorsal dissection of the brain. And that's sort of it. He split it open though, or she did, so you can't tell too well. Um, all right, so this is the anterior side of the brain up here. This is obviously the cerebellum and the cerebral hemispheres have been separated. Here's the corpus callosum on this side and the fornix, that's a lateral ventricle in there. That's the thalamus, that large rounded elevation. Um, on this side, see the pineal glands, not on this side, but there's a thalamus on this side. Oh, there's a septum pellucidum. See how you can't see the hole in there? You can see the hole in this side. That's a septum pellucidum. That's the corpus callosum, that's the fornix, the thalamus again. Then this little bitty thing right there is the pineal gland. This large elevation is the superior colliculus. This little rounded elevation at the bottom is the inferior colliculus. Collectively together, they're called the corpora quadrigemina. Now, I was specifically looking for, oh, here it is, this. Here's your corpora quadrigemina intact, the two superior colliculi and the two inferior colliculi. They call this the baby's butt, the superior colliculi. It looks like a little baby's butt. So the superior colliculi are involved in visual reflexes uh, to control your head and trunk muscles and neck muscles. And then the inferior colliculi control uh, auditory reflexes to regulate skeletal muscles in your head, neck, and, and upper chest and trunk. Um, that's the fourth ventricle would be down there below the cerebellum, by the way. All right, so that's the sheep brain. Pretty cool, huh? Would we have seen that in class if we had in-person class? Um, I think the sheep brain dissection is going to be on the practical. I'm assuming it's in one of those pre- or post-lab assignments. Did anybody see them yet? But I think if, if they're not in there, you could do a Google on a sheep brain. And at the back of our chapter, it says sheep brain dissection, whole brain. And it, it lists out what you're supposed to be identifying. And you can pull up Google sheep brain dissection, just like I did. And they're all labeled. You could pull up nothing but labeled pictures like this. Whoops. Like that. And I mean, you can get a billion hits on on these brains and some of them you could do like a work thing so this is i'll just run through some of these with you and you just review the video later um this is the optic uh olfactory bulb right here um this is the cerebrum they don't label the different parts of it but that would be like a frontal lobe parietal lobe occipital lobe this is the corpus callosum this is the uh, septum pellucidum. You don't have to know the rostrum and whatnot on the corpus callosum. That's why don't worry about those. Just know corpus callosum and the fornix at the bottom. Um, this is the optic chiasm. This is the thalamus, or the op what the optic nerves would be. The thalamus, hypothalamus. The pineal gland lying on top of the thalamus area. This is the third ventricle around the thalamus, which is not really labeled. This is the superior colliculus. This is a portion of the inferior colliculus right here. We can't see the bump too well on this one, though. Um, this is the midbrain. And all of a sudden, what the cerebral peduncle would be down here. This is 
the um, pons and then the medulla oblongata. And behind there, they don't have a bunch of them. That would be the spinal cord. This is the cerebral aqueduct. It, remember, the aqueduct always runs in the middle of the midbrain. So this is all the midbrain. That little, that little tube going through there is always a cerebral aqueduct. And then we have the cerebellum. Let's see if we have uh, another few pictures. So, you, yeah, you can pull pictures up like that. You can pull these pictures up. There's pictures everywhere, right? Um, again, the cerebrum, the corpus callosum with a piece of the septum pellucidum intact. Inside there, the cavity is the lateral ventricle. The bottom part right there is called the fornix. We have the optic chiasm. You have uh, the hypothalamus is not labeled, but it would be right here. The thalamus, that round elevation there with the third ventricle that goes around it. Um, this is the pineal gland that lies just on top of the thalamus. Always look for that circle and above it, that little ball is always the pineal gland. The large rounded elevation is always the superior colliculus. The one that's below it, the little rounded elevation is always the inferior colliculus. Superior for visual reflexes, inferior for auditory reflexes. The cerebral aqueduct runs in the middle of the midbrain, that little open cavity. Remember, cerebral spinal fluid is flowing all down through here, right? Um, and then below there, below the cerebellum, we have the fourth ventricle right there. Um, the midbrain is all this region. So at the top, it would be the colliculi, and at the bottom would be the cerebral peduncles. That's the midbrain. The large elevation behind it is the pons, and then the medulla oblongata to the spinal cord, right? So the medulla oblongata is always the one that is more beneath the last part of the cerebellum, and then we have the spinal cord behind there. Arbor vitae is the white matter of the cerebellum. The gray matter is called the folia. All right, so I went over those names a few times already. Those are the types of things you're going to be identifying, all right? All right, so that's it for today. I know it was a long lab, but we had a lot to do, and I had to redo part of it, like 20 minutes of it in the beginning because I messed up my, sheet, my, my screen share. Sorry about that. Um, so before I let you go for today, I'm going to call out these names, and then if you have questions, I will, I, will, I will field them. If you already know that I have you marked here, from the beginning and you don't have questions you're free to leave just work on your exercise nine material for today all right if you don't hear your name I already have you um if you hear your name holler at me ingleton kennedy kindler can you all still hear me yes yes martin here. All right, very good. Um, I thought I marked. I saw you here earlier. I thought I marked you here. Must not have. Uh, priest. Showers. Stewart. Vincent. And Washington. All right, I have everybody here. All right, now, does anybody have any questions for me um, before we leave for today? All right, 